Game one in the books for Oklahoma State. It's a 44-20 win over South Dakota State to kick off Mike Gundy's 20th season as the head coach at OSU. Along with TJ Eckert, I am Colby Daniels. We're breaking down what we saw in game number one here at Boone Pickens Stadium today. TJ, I guess uh, biggest takeaway from the action this afternoon. Cool stat from the game notes. This is OSU's 29th straight win in an opener, and it ends South Dakota State's 29-game win streak. So a little parallel there. Uh, we talked about it a little bit in our postgame wrap that we did earlier. Uh, Ollie Gordon looked good, and that was expected, right? He looked like a guy that could win the Heisman <laughs> Trophy if they give him the ball enough, right? Had a... Had a handful of, what, 32 total 32 touches? 32 touches, 27 carries, there was, five receptions. There was a few times late in the game where I looked at you and said, probably ought to get that guy out of there, right? It just felt like game was in hand, uh, but he looked good. So that was, that was the right. big thing for me was Ollie Gordon looked good both in the run game and the passing game. Mike Gunny was a little, not frustrated, but said we need to clean some things up in the run game. Felt like there weren't as many holes there as he would have liked. Uh, but South Dakota State's good. Uh, so, so, so I'll say player takeaway is Ollie Gordon, but for me, and we haven't really touched on this, it felt like there wasn't any point in this game that OSU wasn't in control. I think there was some totally there were some spots where it was like, okay, South Dakota State's maybe string together a drive here, but there was never a point where I was like, boy, look out. And that happened it a never lot. It felt like the Cowboys were in trouble. And it right? happened yeah. a lot last year in some of these non-conference games. And it felt like, and a really good team felt like they controlled things for the most part. It was a close game early, but to your point, I mean, it felt like Oklahoma State controlled yeah. things from start to finish, and there was never a, a moment. In this game, where I thought, "Uh oh, yeah. you know, here come the Jackrabbits, right. or Oklahoma State might be falling into a trap." Uh, you know, they they took care of business for the most. And part. a really quick point on that too: there was a point in the second half. I think they scored to make it a, a make it a two possession game again. I think OSU comes out, gets the ball first in the third quarter and scores, extends their lead. But then South Dakota State comes right back down the field and scores maybe in four or five plays. And so that is the only point in the game where you're thinking, okay, maybe maybe the Jackrabbits have found something. And to OSU's credit, to your point, they they squashed any momentum they had, um, went down the field and scored again. So I I, I know we I didn't want to step on you there, but that was you're something good, that good, was yeah. it. It was interesting because there was ne that, that was a that was a point in the game maybe in years past where things maybe could have snowballed a little bit. And this veteran team I think was able to handle that moment pretty well. With a younger team watching somebody answer yes. what you just yeah. did, yeah, that can maybe make you uh, right. a little rattled, but. Right. Uh, this team was totally settled from start to finish. Uh, I want to start with Ollie Gordon, and, and we'll kind of work our way through. 32 touches overall. I mean, that that feels like a lot yeah. for a season <laughs> opener right. from a guy that you're expecting to have a big workload this season. He right. is, you know, the, the bell cow for this team. They needed it, I mean, in terms of trying to get rushing production. And this is where I want to get your take and, and maybe explain this to people. Mike Gundy said that they didn't run the ball well tonight. They didn't run the ball up to his level of expectation. I think we would all agree with that. Simultaneously, you can say that Ollie Gordon played a heck of a game. Yeah. So how do you balance when somebody asks you, like, how can both of those things be true? How, how do you explain that to a fan? It's interesting because I think, to me, what he's getting at is that there was too many, too much contact before the line of scrimmage or near the line of scrimmage. And so... Ollie Gordon had to do a lot of work himself to get the yards that he got. And so that's probably where it's coming from. Like, that's why Ollie had totally a good game agree. is because yeah. he did it himself. You, right. you would rather him not have to worry about it, uh, and we call them gashes in the defense. You'd rather gash the defense with some nice blocking up front. There were some, there was a few plays like that where he was able to get to the second level f virtually untouched. But for the most part, there was contact at or near the line of scrimmage, and Ollie, being Ollie, was able to get the yards himself. And so I think that is where those – both those statements can be true because Ollie had a great game because he had to do a lot himself. That's and right. the run game needs to improve because the offensive line, who I think they're expecting to lean on this year, needed to be a little bit better in terms of opening up holes. On the majority of his plus gains, he was having to make someone yeah. miss near the line of scrimmage and or run over right. somebody exactly. or bounce off of somebody yes. ultimately to get those those plus runs. Uh, you know, he had a couple of highlights. We mentioned before the game in, in our pregame stream like, what is the balance of, you know, getting Ollie his opportunities, getting him his numbers, because he's a Heisman candidate, right? right. And, you know, letting, letting uh, some of the younger guys have a chance and letting Ollie Gordon, you know, get his work in and sit on the sideline. Right. I, I thought he was done going into the fourth quarter. I, know. I said to you, I, there's no way Ollie Gordon's playing again. Yeah. And then South Dakota State scores a touchdown, and I thought, okay, maybe they'll throw him back out there. They did a couple more drives. I don't know if it was just to get him over the century mark or what the situation was, but when you started to look at the number of carries and that the game was completely in hand at that point, felt like it. 
I, I think that goes back to our, our conversation in the pregame about making sure he hits certain statistical benchmarks to keep his name and you know that that spotlight on Oklahoma State University. You think that's in Gundy's mind? You think that's something he thinks about? I I would imagine not, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, he it's, likes the publicity. You know, I, th- I think he likes the spotlight being on Oklahoma State. I, I would say in a close game, it's probably not. No. In a game that you are controlling where you're not having to worry about every play potentially right. being the difference between winning and losing, you probably are able to, to go further down the list of, oh, let's get Ollie Gordon to the century mark or, you know, whatever the situation was. I mean, in any other circumstance, Ollie Gordon's not playing in the fourth quarter, Yeah, right? that's what I thought. And so it was interesting. We've talked about it on the stream. We've talked about it in passing, like uh, Mike Gundy being conservative. Mike Gundy seems not starting fast. They went for a couple fourth downs that maybe they don't go for in years yeah, past. Yeah. They they ran. They had a bunch of tempo through the majority of the game. He did say late when it when the game didn't really feel put away, they kind of laid back and were trying to just kind of milk the clock. And right. he would have rather seen them maybe go a little bit more tempo even as the game was coming down. They were throwing with like four minutes left. Yeah. I mean, there was I was I was shocked that they were still running offense with the game again. It was forty four twenty late. And they were still running offense. And so that was interesting, too. So a, a little point on us saying that Gunny can be conservative sometimes. There was a few things happening yeah. in this opener where we thought he'd be vanilla. They ran a flea flicker. They had a reverse early on. So there was a few things that happened that weren't uh, status quo for, for a Gunny coach team. Yeah, I'm, and I will say, you know, the thought process, as, as you mentioned, his comments in the post game, the thought process could have been, like, let's let Ollie get one more drive to really yeah. suck seven or eight minutes off the clock and, right. and put this right. thing away officially. Uh, and you, you don't know if, if your backup running backs are going to be able to do that. Again, partly because of the lack of a dominant push right. on the line of scrimmage. But uh, I will say about Mike Gundy and some of the criticism of, of being conservative and not overly aggressive, you have to operate with what your personnel is, yeah, right? And absolutely. there have been teams in the past that offensively, I wouldn't have felt like there was a great chance they're picking up fourth and short, right? Yeah, and you sure. have you've had some really good defenses the past few years. I, I go back to the... The Malcolm Rodriguez year, that defense was off the charts great, and they were ultra conservative on offense that season yeah. because they could lean on the yes. defense, and there was no reason to put your strongest group in a bad position. Right. This year, I think you have an offense that that has to make you feel confident in rolling the dice in those situations. So I've never understood just the blanket Mike Gundy is conservative criticism. No. I, I think he's been pretty good about – being conservative when, you know, you look at the X's and O's and, and the strengths and weaknesses of his football team, and it yeah. says you should be conservative. And I think tonight was an example of, of you have the right personnel right. to roll the dice in, in certain moments. And I think the, the access to information that everybody has now and the analytics, the analytics say going in forward on fourth down more, it makes more sense. And so everybody that sits in these bleachers has access to that now. That's and right. then when they see their coach not go forward on fourth and four from the 50, they're like, well, What's going on? Why isn't our coach paying attention to that? Well, there's a reason for that, and yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. Is, is, is We always say KYP, right? Know your personnel. That's right. So that's kind of what Mike Gundy's done in his, in his past. What did you think about Alan Bowman today? Uh, we said it earlier, be a game manager. That's what he was, man. He, he, he made good throws. He actually uh, had some numbers taken away from him, a couple of nice throws in the end zone. DeJon Sterling dropped a touchdown. Uh, Rashad Owens dropped a touchdown early as well. So there's a few throws in there that I think – were catchable and should have been caught really and weren't and so that could have yeah. the stat line still ended up being really solid he distributed well uh gundy mentioned in the post game that a lot of their offense is rpo based and so you have to know your offense and know how to read a defense to operate in the rpo games and felt like he did a pretty good job of that distributed the ball well spread it around pretty good uh they folk they put a focus on brennan presley early uh, didn't, I'm not sure if, how many catches he had after halftime. He had like five or six I, at I'm, half. I'm not sure if I remember him catching yeah. a, a ball after had, maybe the first quarter. He scored but a yeah, touchdown, he, obviously. He early made an, an impact. He was, a, he was a big impact. So, again, so Bowman did a great job. There was one ball uh, that almost got picked off, and I think we looked at each other and said, that's the first one I think that's kind of been in harm's way. And so do that. That's all you need to do, yeah. and, uh, and you're going to be successful when you have a guy like Allie Gordon you can hand the ball off to. So I, th- I thought he was solid. I thought he played well. You've got a lot of, of terrific weapons at the receiver position, yeah. and you have that running game. He doesn't need to try to be Superman. No. I thought he did a great job. To your point, I mean, the only throw I can remember was in the fourth quarter yeah. where he put the ball in danger, and that was it. Other than that, he took care of the ball. And, again, 
there's such a negative connotation with the term game manager. That's what Oklahoma State needs him to be is yeah. a guy that is going to manage the offense, not make mistakes, mm -hmm. get the ball where it needs to go when his number is called. He did a great job of that. He doesn't need to throw for 400 yards every week. No. If he's having to, then you're probably in a bad situation right. to begin with. Right. So I thought he passed with flying colors. You know, I, I, again, the one ball that he threw that, that was in danger is, is it. And for an opener – I mean, I think yeah, you can you live with that. that. And uh, on a week-to-week -week basis, you know, clearly that's uh, that's going to be a priority is taking care of the football. Yeah. Um, I, I also felt like in terms of the passing game, it was ultra vanilla. I mean, they, sure. they took a few shots, but uh, the routes being run, I mean, there was nothing really exotic. In no, the there wasn't. Game, and, and that's somewhat expected, I think, going yeah. into the opener at Oklahoma State. Yeah, and it was good to see Dazon Stribling back. You know, back from injury, and, and he looked good. The chemistry with him and, and Alan Bowman looked good, too. Uh, so that just adds another element to this offense. Gavin Freeman had a couple catches, I think, former Sooner. So that was uh, good to see him getting involved as well. So, yeah, I, you know, the offense itself I, th I thought was solid. Didn't There wasn't anything flashy. We kind of talked about that after the game, too. It was like, there's really not anything that was like, whoa, that was impressive. Ollie was good. Like, Ollie Gordon made some, some wow plays. And other than that, yeah, yeah, it was just kind of take care of business. They plotted along and, and got their 44, and, and that's how they did it. So, yeah, offense looked good. Uh, I know we're about to talk about the defense, too, and, and I thought they were just just fine as well. Yeah, you know, last year one of the big issues with the defense was, was the big plays, right? They yeah. gave up so many explosive plays, and for as many stretches as they would have where they played solid – that is completely undone by a couple possessions where yeah. you give up, you know, a 50-yard, 60-yard play, let the team that, that has been somewhat shut down, mm -hmm. you know, gain a little momentum, get into the red zone, whether that, that produces a touchdown or a field goal. Uh, we saw a couple of those today. I don't think it was anything egregious that I would be flying no. the red flag over, but it is something that was an issue last year and is going to have to continue to be uh, something that they stress to this football team that has to be fixed. Got any mention in post game? The two big things they wanted to fix was better run game, like you mentioned, and then limiting big plays on defense. There was maybe four or five chunk plays. And I think he was trying to do the math in his head at the podium. I think he said that if you take away five or four or five of the big plays they had, that was accounted for the majority of their of that's their right, offense. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, to your point, that's still something they're focusing on. Uh, there weren't. A, it didn't look like there was a ton of receivers running wide open. Uh, on the, there was a touchdown in the second half, but that was pretty evident. Uh, maybe one in the first half too. I can't remember the. No, it was the second half. So that, that happened. Other than that, though, I felt like they were pretty sound. Tackling looked pretty good for the most part for game one. That's something you always pay attention to. thought they did a good job tackling there. Uh, let's see, what else was there? I, I thought, you know, Corey Black had the interception. That was nice. Uh, that he had a, a, made a good play on the ball. Uh, quarterback for South Dakota State was, was good. I feel like they did a good job. Again, we talked about internal pressure, pressure from, you know, defensive tackles, nose guards, whatever, who, whatever front they're in. Uh, Looked like there was a lot in his face, and he was throwing off his back foot a lot. And so I think that that, that was also a, a, an added bonus for, for Brian Nardo's defense. And to give the secondary a little credit, I do think that, that when there were some big plays, uh, I know at least a couple of them were because the quarterback was able to extend the sure, play yeah. and then make a throw. So, yeah. uh, you know, you can't, you can't ask those guys on the back end to defend forever. Right. No, no corner or safety right. is going to be able to cover for, you know, X amount of time. So. Yeah. Uh, when you have a quarterback that can't extend, and, and he was able to do that a couple times, mm -hmm. feeling the pressure, you know, that, that's where I think you had a couple of those breakdowns. Yeah, and there was there – was, Colin Oliver made some nice plays. Good to see him. He was almost – not non-existent last year, but, man, he had such a good year two years ago. Expectations were so yeah. high, and he couldn't really find his groove with Brian Nardo in that scheme. Uh, had, had a couple of nice plays today, so that was – that was good to see Nick Martin look good. Uh, Justin Wright was not available today. That's why we didn't see him. We okay. talked about him in the yeah, pregame yeah. stream. Uh, found out after that ended that Justin Wright was out, perhaps with injury, just being held out precautionary. Uh, so that's why we didn't see him. Uh, but Nick Martin looked good. Colin Oliver looked good. Kendall Daniels. Kendall Daniels. What did you think? Uh, I, I, he seemed to be all over the field. Uh, yeah. I don't remember how many, like, big impact plays he made, but he seemed to be pretty active in terms of just being around the ball. So that was the thing, yeah. It, it, you, he didn't, like, flash, but he didn't, at least from our perspective, didn't bust a right, lot. And right. if he did, it was something that we missed. So I, we, for the most part, he was around the ball. He made the plays he needed to make. He was physical at the point of attack, which was good. Uh, I leaned over to you at one point and said, South Coast State's physical. Like, they're playing yeah. hard. They were, yeah. they were getting some big hits on Ollie Gordon. When they weren't cramping uh, up. Yeah, they, yeah sure. oof. And I'm surprised he didn't address that in the post game. 
because he was not happy. He was very, very unhappy. It's a you know, it's it's it's, so, it's just as much a strategy as their silly little substitution thing they do, where the, where a team subs in, right? And then OSU waits till the last minute, and then they walk their guys out there and walk the guy off the field, yeah, to get yeah. the late game. So yeah. that's all part of the game. It's all strategy. It just looks worse when your guys are laying on the field cramping. I, I don't like it. I'm not a fan of that. Uh, they need to work on the substitution rule too. But I digress on that. I think that. I, I, something needs to change there because that happened, was it 10 plus times? Eight, oh, eight to 10 I, times? I, I, I can't even put a number on it because there was just a point where I just thought, this is wild. Now, it is wild to see. Now, they are from South Dakota. Thank you. Right? Yes, they like, don't play they, in humidity. They don't ex- experience anything like <laughs> the still. humidity that we had in, in Stillwater today, and we certainly felt it uh, on the sideline just shooting the game, and we're not out there running and no, trying to make with plays. Pads, so, yeah. um, to a degree, I do understand some of it, but I, I would have, if I, if, if I had to bet, I would say that, that a lot of that was uh, was overdone, for sure. <laughs> I think there was some cramping, but then it was, it was unfortunately mixed in with yeah. some, I need to get it down so my guys can get a breather. So, uh, yeah, that was frustrating. But they were physical, and, and you know, I think in terms of the line of scrimmage, uh, I, I don't know that I look at, at this game as, like, Oklahoma State was great on the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball or bad. Uh, it's just, I, I think uh, they're going to have to be better. I think going into the Arkansas game. So it feels like, I think so, and it feels like South Dakota State in the run game controlled the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Felt like they had more gaps to run through on offense, and then I feel like they closed up gaps on defense. Now, on the flip side, I thought OSU's pass protection was great. Either that or Jack Rabbits weren't blitzing. That's possible. But Alan Bowman had a ton of time. And then I felt like OSU's pass rush was better against the pass protection of South Dakota State. So, you know, maybe call it a wash, change, but yeah, yes. in some aspects. Um, but it did feel like the Jackrabbits controlled things in the run game on both sides. But yeah, to your point against Arkansas, uh, some things they'll, they'll need to improve, especially in the run game, because you're facing a bigger, probably more physical front, uh, an SEC front from the Razorbacks, and a team that's probably going to be highly motivated to come in and, and play well since this is an old rivalry game. Now, I think someone asked Gundy about it afterwards and, and said, you're not old enough to remember playing in it, but you remember grew up watching it. So I'll have to look up the last time they played. I'm not even sure. I have that yeah, off the top I, of my head. I wouldn't be able to, to put a number on that by any means, but it is next week's opponent. Uh, in terms of what your expectation of Oklahoma State was and what we saw as we get ready to spin it forward, uh, where, would you, where would you put that? I think they're still the same. I mean, I feel like I felt – About what you thought? About what I thought, and I thought they played uh, – given – so we talked about this. The loss to South Alabama, I think, was the best thing for this team facing an FCS opponent. And the fact that they won back-to-back national championships. Like, if they were playing North Dakota State, would they have that same preparation, preparedness, if you will? As Because all offseason they've been hearing about you know, 29 straight wins. In fact, the players were, like, talking smack after the game about, like, what win streak? What? It's like, dude, it's an FCS team. Like, I don't know. What, but – They've probably been hearing about it all off season, That's right? right? About how yeah. good this team is, and so well, and, and nationally, they were on the upset alert all week, right? Sure. For this for this first weekend of college football collectively. At one point, it was a I think it ended in like twelve or thirteen, but at one point it was nine and a half was the line. That's an yeah. FCS team on the road against a ranked opponent. That's yeah. So to answer your question, I feel like my expectations for this team are similar to what they were coming in because. I, we, I think we both agreed that they would handle their business today. Yes. Um, and so I, I, I feel like the one thing that was a little concerning was that the offensive line in the run game wasn't as sharp as I thought it would Agreed. be. Uh, but I expect to see uh, that change. 1980, by the way, was the last time oh, wow. OSU and Arkansas played. I just looked it up. So, uh, so neither one of us were alive. Uh, no, no. They And they played every year. Sorry, they were in the same conference. They played every year. Golly, look at that. All the way back to 1943, basically. 1950, sorry. Yeah. So they played, to get, they played each other for 30 straight years, haven't played in 44 years now. So that'll be fun uh, with that game coming up next weekend. And that's an Arkansas team that put up a big number on the scoreboard in their opener. They have uh, the quarterback transfer out of Boise State, yeah. who is a dual threat mm-hmm. option, and he looked really good. Uh, Jaquindon Jackson, the running back, I, I, I had a pretty – Pretty good game. He is from Utah. He was in that crowded backfield for the Utes sure, a year yeah. ago. Uh, we obviously know about Luke Haas and, mm-hmm. and what a, a problematic matchup he can be he if they if they target him. Uh, but it's an Arkansas team that's going to come in here and I think have enough to uh, challenge the Cowboys. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited to see what this is going to look like. It'll be week. it'll be fun. It'll be fun with uh, you know Sam Pittman will be able to talk more about the rivalry than probably Mike Gundy's a little bit older and has been a part of. He's been in Oklahoma for a long time. He understands this area of the of the, of the country in terms of those types of rivalry games. 
It'll be fun. It, it, these are the types of non-conference games I enjoy is when you're able to renew some of these rivalries. Yeah. They're regional. OSU Tulsa is going to be a fun one just because they're so close to each other. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, that'll be good. And it'll be a good test for Oklahoma State coming off what was a, a pretty nice win here against the Jackrabbits. Well, uh, that wraps up a three-day stretch where you have been at Chapman Stadium, Gaylord, and now Boone Pickens Stadium. How are yes. you feeling now? Three good, games man. in the book. We're good, Three man. It's, in the book. It's, it's college football season, man. This is, this, is, this is the fun part of the year. You know, we've been sitting around all summer waiting for this to get here. Now the first weekend's over, and that's what people talk about on social media all the time. It's like, man, you may complain about who your team's playing this week. It's a dud. It's a nobody. But it's like you only get 12 of them. Right. Right? And you'd right. rather be watching them play nobody than – sitting at home in the summer and watching nothing. So yeah. uh, fired up at this time of the year. Here. I wasn't in Tulsa Thursday night, obviously, but uh, last night in Norman and today in Stillwater, just the air, right? You just, <laughs> it, it just you breathe it in and Love it's it, man. sweeter. And the atmospheres in both Norman and here I thought were off the charts great, and I think there's just a ton of excitement for college football. So this next weekend here in Stillwater will be really good for Arkansas. 11 a.m. kick may, you know, may take a while for guys to wake up. But I think it's going to be a great crowd here. And then Houston for OU is a night game, and those are always great in Norman. So we should get two more really good ones next weekend, too. All right. Any final thoughts? Uh, I'm going to go eat. I don't know how crowded Eskimo Joe's is at <laughs> 6.50 on a game night, but uh, we're going to go find something to eat, I think. Find something <laughs> somewhere, whatever might be open. Yeah, there you uh, go. And we might be the last uh, – the last couple non-stadium workers uh, we're close. in the facility. We're close. So we are going to say farewell. Everyone have a great rest of your Labor Day weekend. A lot more college football That's tonight right. and over the course of the weekend. And a big week, too, coming up next week. And we'll have you covered all week long. For TJ Eckert, I'm Colby Daniels. Everybody have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you soon.